halfway point of the 2024 Super Rugby Pacific season, a season that has produced some thrilling action and some big upsets. Tenako Tokato, good evening and welcome into the breakdown. Well, Sam Whitelock has officially announced that the end of his rugby career is very near, so we start the conversation. Is he the greatest lock of all time? And if not, then who? We'll get into that debate a little bit later on. Plus, a confirmation the news that none of us wanted. Cam Roygaard is out for at least the next six months. So we talk about what that means for the halfback stocks in New Zealand with one of our greatest ever. And the Super Rugby Opiki Finals have been confirmed, the Hong Kong Sevens final and so much more. Taylor Johnson, great to have you back on the programme. Marsha, good to have you too. Uh, and Mills, as always. Awesome to be here. What a <laughs> hey, great weekend and some good stuff coming up. Well, I'll tell you what, no stitch-ups tonight. No <laughs> stitch-ups and no surprises. And I'm very happy about that one. But remember the stitch-up from last week with Jeff Wilson. The Crusaders sent him up this lovely jersey, Marshy, uh, and that is now up for auction. So if you're in New Zealand, uh, you can jump onto the Trade Me website and look up Crusaders jersey breakdown, uh, and you can bid on this jersey signed by the 2024 team. How much would you pay for that, Marshy? Just over 1,200, Kirsty. Well, you're in luck. I know I am, <laughs> because I've done my research. Jump on, <laughs> jump on, and you can bid on that auction. What do you think, in all seriousness? I mean, a jersey like that, you still don't know who's going to win Super Rugby. This team could end up winning 2024. What would the jersey be worth then? A lot of money. Yeah, I'd say it would be. I mean, it's hard to notice who's on that sort of jersey, the, the signatures. But what I can say, what a great, great course mm. yeah. that money's going to. I mean, kids can. They're fantastic. And it's a, it's a cool jersey as well, like obviously it's hard to see from the television and it's so far away, but the detail in it's amazing, like the modern day jerseys, mm. so much better Mills than, <laughs> well, not when you played, but really when I played, like they were just a piece of cotton that you threw on and they were heavy and they're nothing else, this thing's streamlined, it's got the detail of the Crusaders symbol and obviously the signatures, so... Once the Crusaders make the eight, then go on to win the title, it'll be very valuable. Still, so get on it, big still, time. Still confident, are you, of winning a, another title in 2024? It's perfectly set up, isn't it? It's going to be a <laughs> sneaky little progressive incline towards uh, getting to the final. OK, uh, well, while you're on the programme, Marshy, it would be remiss of us not to talk about halfbacks. Mm. Uh, and as I said earlier in the week, Cam Roygaard's injury news uh, came out. He has broken his patella, had surgery in Auckland on Tuesday, but it does mean that he'll be out of the game for at least six months, which for the Hur Hurricanes, devastating news. For him, absolutely devastating as well. And for the All Blacks and New Zealand rugby fans. Gutted. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like six months is reasonably optimistic, but tell tendon, uh, they can be very niggly. So r a real shame for Cam Roygaard, you know, on top of his game after a breakout season last year, became an all-black, catastrophic. But he's tough, he's resilient, he'll recover and he'll be back. And, and we wish him a speedy recovery and getting back. But obviously that then tests the resources, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, where, where do we go now? Incumbent Aaron Smith is gone. Um, so that, that then poses the question as to who steps up into that starting role for a start off. But let's, let's, before we get into the bait, let me throw this out there to everybody. Cam Roygaard has played three test matches for the All Blacks. Three. Not 30, not 300, three. So he's replaceable. So he's replaceable. And, and there was always an opportunity for somebody. Yeah. So he wasn't the incumbent. Um, Aaron Smith was, and he had such longevity in the jersey, that's what's created the problem. Mm. And, I, and I think, given that you're right, he has only had three, but his form... Was amazing. In the, this last five weeks... He you know, had to be the guy, right? And that's why. He, he, was, he, he was out and out the best sort of um, you know, nine in this competition so far, and that's now why it's created this whole, OK, well, who's, who's going to come off next now? Now that he's gone. Isn't it 
isn't that incredible? Because this time last year we were thinking he's totally a bolter. He, you know, what, how amazing yeah. would it be if he made the All Blacks? And now we're saying, oh no, the All Blacks are in trouble. That he's not going to be there. I mean, what a 12 months he's had, and it goes down to his form. He's been incredible since school. We've saw him play there um, for counties. He was awesome too. And so he's just gone from strength to strength after being in that All Black environment um, and made himself really valuable. So who is the guy then? Who is the guy right now that is putting their hand up higher than anyone else? Well, 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 that's what intrigues me, because regardless of all of that, we were green in that position, really green. Mm. And, and when you enter into test matches, which the first one will be against England, England, bang, bang, and then Fiji, but then Rugby Championship, you're looking at a lot of uh, inexperience in that jersey. So probably you'd have to say, right, like Finley Christie for a start off, like he's been in the environment the longest. He's the guy that when you think about, OK, do we want security? Do we want somebody that's actually been in the mix before? Then Finley Christie has to enter into the equation. I don't feel he's an incumbent, but I feel that he's the most logical player that the All Blacks know that they can get out of him in a test match level because they've seen it before. What about TJ Pedernada then? Because... I mean, how many test matches has he played for the All Blacks? 100%. And, 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 and I feel that the Roy Guard injury leaves that door open for TJ. And TJ is a competitor. He's tough. We all know him well, don't we? He's the type of guy that would relish the opportunity to get back in the All Black jersey, and he won't let you down. And just having him in the environment will be great. So Scott Robertson might think, OK, right, in the dynamic of it all, I, I've, I've got to have that reliability there to work around the unpredictable and, and that greenness that, that's probably going to be there. And, and I don't know, do you agree, Mills, Taylor, that having him there is not anything that, uh, other than a positive? Yeah, I, I definitely 100% agree. I, I think when you sort of look, look at it, it brings up the other sort of stages. You know, when you're an all-black coach and you've just come in, you want to get success, you know? And so now he's got a, an opportunity now to, to put someone Perhaps a little bit more safe than Christy, put him out there because he's been in the environment. TJ comes in, he's got a wealth of experience. And do they sort of bolster that and go, well, when England come down, well, one, I've got to get, I've got to get results, right? And that's always on the back end of the, uh, of the coach's mind. So having a guy like TJ there that can possibly even start, that, that's yeah. kind of safe. But I guess when we look at the other guys that you sort of kind of mentioned, um, Marsh, a little bit later on, what, what, what do the All Blacks need? We need something possibly a little bit different from that, you know, yeah. the, like the Whakatavas. That's what Cam Roy guard, that's why that hole was so big, because he brought everything. Yeah. And, and that's a good thing is that there is actually a huge pipeline of young players, but who is ready for the All Black jersey is what, you know, because you said Roy Gard, you think of Cortez Ratiman or Hotham or those kind of guys too. They're almost there, but probably not quite, whereas Cam Roy Gard was ticking that box. So it's do you bring in a TJ and then blood someone else up as well? It's, it's difficult, but it is good. We do have a pipeline, but they're not just at that level we need them to be at yet. Yeah, absolutely agree. But they're not, they're not far off where Cam exactly. Roy Gard was. Yeah. You, you talk about Ratuma, you talk, mm. you talk about Hotham, those guys are... Uh, there are only three test matches behind yeah. Cam Roygaard. Yeah, exactly. And all they need to be is in the environment, around guys like TJ Peranata, who, who, who will, will nurture them through that. The good thing about TJ is he's really used to the role that he's fulfilling now. Yeah. He had to play underneath Roygaard, he had to play underneath Aaron Smith, comes off the bench really well. Mm. Like, at the end of the day, I, I look at it and I go, what has Hotham gone wrong, uh, done wrong? What has Cortez Latimer done wrong? Mm. Nothing. Mm. Like, they have the same, same capabilities, they have the potential. It's just about, are we prepared to go, clean slate, Aaron Smith's gone. Mm. Scott Robertson goes, righto, bang. You know what? We've got to make a stand here somewhere and find somebody new and find the future. Mm. Have you got the courage to do that? And, and, I, and I feel that we've got the talent. We've got the depth. And we've got Fakatava as well, who's been there and been there, bef been there before. I just question his consistency at the moment. But we've got the talent. Well, you know Razor. I'm confident. You know Razor. Surely he's got the courage. And, and he's got the ability to do it because everybody's going to give him a little bit of rope yeah. because of Aaron Smith going. Yeah. You know, how do you... you he's irreplaceable, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. That's yeah. right. That's right. And they are going to give a bit of, a bit of rope in, in terms of that to build that team. And, you know, yesteryears you'd go on coaches and, and the expectation is to win all those. So he's got a bit of time to be able to you know, manoeuvre guys around, sort of find who that halfback is. But mm. I, I agree with Marshy. I think... The stock is there. Yeah. Whilst it's green, um, the other, the only bit about it is that 
Razor has to find that person. And it's up for these guys to be able to put, put their hand up. Well, uh, one man that we haven't spoken about who was a standout across the weekend for the Blues, and that is Tofa Funaki. Is, is he a potential? Look, he's young and he's taking his opportunities. I mean, he was outstanding uh, against the force. He took his opportunity. He doesn't often get a start. Um, but he runs perfect lines. I think you mentioned him, um, Mills, during the weekend. He's always in the right place at the right time. And he is rapid, but also he's a physical nine as well. So to me, he is also the whole package. And he's obviously working side by side with Finlay Christie, and he's learning off someone who has been in that all-black environment. But I think Telfar was a real standout, as he said, in the right place, right time. But he's really grown um, each time we've seen him from Auckland NBC. He's... I think he's only you know in his twenties, twenty-two, I think. But he's been with the Blues since he was in high school, so he's 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 taken his time to develop. But he's I think it's good that they haven't put him out there too early. Um, mm -hmm. And now he's really energetic, eh? I mean, and it helps when your four pack starting to dominate too. So, but the thing is, you know, will he continue to have that? You know, is it um, a chance now for Vernon Carter to go? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna mix it up, and between him and Christie, the, the big thing about him is that the fact that will he be behind Christie, so mm. he's not going to be tested in the big games, mm. um, and that's probably going to be the biggest issue, but I, I totally agree. You know, the, the way he's playing, he's energetic, he kicks really well, um, and when he gets the opportunity, he, um, he goes out there and, and takes it. Someone who stood out for you on the weekend, Dalton Papali, are you starting to see from Dalton what you want to in 2024? There's, there's glimpses there, right? Um, and admittedly, I mean, the defeats from the force is pretty woeful, but I like how active he was. He broke a few, he was really, I mean, he's been out with injury, um, but coming in there and, and showing his leadership, um, you know, first and foremost, uh, you've got his, his hands on the, on the ball early. Um, and I like that. And I like the fact that they look a bit more composed around him. Um, but stuff like this uh, in the weekend, and I know, as I said before, the tackling was a bit invisible, but I like what he's, he's starting to produce. Yeah, and, and you're right, uh, the tackling wasn't that great from the force either, but nor was their attack, so he actually had to find work in other places than his bread and butter at the breakdown. He was actually putting himself in the right spot on attack, getting in the right shapes, and just making himself look busy, considering they didn't actually have to do too many tackles as well. So I like the way he played. I think he was good. If we head down to Hamilton, and you've had a busy weekend, Marshy, uh, being able to oversee uh, a lot of players this weekend, but someone who stood out was a relatively young player who you got to interview and played with his father, Wallace Sat the skill level on these new players is unbelievable in New Zealand right now. It absolutely is. And I think what really impressed me about Wallace Satiti's performance was it was a genuine number eight performance. It wasn't a performance of a player that's been shifted from six or seven and got an opportunity to eight or had to change around simply because it has to fit the dynamic of the loose forward trio. He played the true style of a number eight. He went off the back of the scrum hard, took on defenders, used his pace. When he attacked players, you can see here in this footage, he attacked them with power. Yes, he's got a skill set, he's got a great offload, he's got work rate, which is key for a number eight. But equally, he just fulfilled the role. He didn't try to do anything outside of the core role of a number eight. And, and when, you, when you think about the fact that, to a degree, apart from Artie, obviously, mm. World Player of the Year, so he, he goes all right, doesn't he? <laughs> but never been a genuine number eight. We really haven't replaced Kieran Reid, who was a genuine out-and-out -out number eight. We never saw Kieran Reid in another jersey because he was a number eight. He, to me, Satiti, is a number eight. How big is he? Because he looked like a he's monster big, on TV. Yeah, he's actually quite, did he make me look small? <laughs> Not really, you oh, good. Like yeah. What are you trying How to say? <laughs> big weekend first, big weekend. <laughs> but is he a beast though? He is, no, he? And, and he's tough. And he actually said that, that Moana Pacifica were, they were tough, they were physical, but he said, I, feel, I felt it out there, but he, he loved it, he, he relished it. I think he's a product of his environment too, because you look at the loose forwards that he's rubbing shoulders with, because we don't often see Wallace, you know, he, he comes off the bench um, quite often, but you look at who he's rubbing shoulders with, like the Luke Jacobsons and um, the Sami Penny Finals, he's learning and he's mm. been a, around for a long time as well, you know, from school and then he was New Zealand 20s, um, but again, Clayton hasn't put him out there too early, he's let him grow, and I really like that about that Chiefs environment, is that he's, he's a product of who he's been working with and under Clayton. If you're not a ball playing forward in New Zealand right now, Mills, no one's talking about you <laughs> because you look at Brayden Yossi, you look at all yeah. these players right now and they have serious skills. Oh, and that's always been our strength, right? I mean, the lower numbers can play like, like backs, the skill yeah. set. I mean, even and you're talking about the loose, he's been able to get a little bit wider. They bring something totally different um, in terms of what they do and you just don't know. I mean, and 
to back that up mm. defensively. You know, these guys are starting to knock knock guys down. So I like what we've got. Um, I, I like the, the cattle that's sort of coming through, but the skill set, you know, extraordinary. Yeah, unbelievable. It was a funny old Super Rugby weekend, if you think about it, because four teams uh, had the bye. Four teams will have a bye next week, and four teams uh, on week nine as well. So three of our New Zealand sides sat out of the fixtures on the weekend. The Super Rugby schedule, is it what it needs to be? Is it engaging you? Is it engaging you at home and the fans more importantly do you think there needs to be I mean discussions about whether you rest one team a week like the NRL do or whether everyone has a, a buy round in one week how should it be done I like that with resting one team like the NRL do, or two at or max, two. you know, to make it even again, because, like, we're going up against the NRL. It's, it's no secret that we're competing with Rugby League, and they've, you know, got game after game after game, and then you only flick on, oh, there's only four games this weekend. You know, if people want to watch rugby, well, they've only got limited options. Obviously, there's Opiki there as well, but there's also NRLW coming up too. So I like resting, you know, it, one or two teams a week and then letting these derby games happen because that's the thing is there wasn't really any huge matchups that people are invested in. Um, yeah, I, I think we should spread out those buys. Do the well, teams actually need the buys? Uh, they, they do because the they, players need are getting to, rested anyway. they need to reset. Yeah, they are getting rested and that's the big debate, isn't it? Because we have this mandatory all-black rest period so we take the stars out and everybody goes, well, you take them out and then, yeah. then we have buy rounds. But... I get it for a macro management of, of a Super Rugby competition if you want to win it, and the coaches need it to a degree. But equally, like we spoke to, to, to like Tana, we spoke um, equally to Vern, and play, they, they wanted to also give a lot of those guys that hold tackle bags each mm. week mm. their opportunities. So that's where the buy comes in. But what the scheduling needs to do is make sure we've still got a blockbuster, you know, a game that everybody's talking about for the weekend. You know, derby games are perfect for it. You know, do, if we saw it the weekend, Chiefs Blues. Um, and the other two teams, Moana Pacifica and the Force, played each other. Mm. We had that blockbuster. Mm. To keep everybody's interest, to keep momentum in the yeah. game, I feel that we need to look at scheduling and make sure that we've got that massive spike of interest going. Really looking forward to that game at the weekend. The others will might play out the way that we expect. Well, they weren't really... I mean, the weekend didn't help either, right? Because they weren't really... In any un unpredictable sort of results, results. other, other than the fact scores. that I mean, they were huge blowouts right mm. other than the fact probably the game in Melbourne because yeah. of the controversy you know that was set around the, the red cards and so I, I think that's right I think just one or two got uh, two sort of games um, or two teams being um, having a buy and having that blockbuster because otherwise you just lose interest you know there's no real real big sort of hit outs um, from the weekend, but certainly, you know, those blowouts, um, you know, the Chiefs game and the, the one up here, they didn't help at all either. These two or three bye weeks sit in between uh, a couple of holidays as well. We had Easter weekend last weekend. We've got Anzac coming up on the 25th. I mean, would you like to see an Anzac Day clash? Would you like to see an Easter Monday match? Well, that was the thing, I think, with the NRL. When people were sitting at home on Easter relaxing, they could flick the TV on and watch NRL games. They couldn't just flick on and watch, you know, a whole lot of Super Rugby games. Um, I think I think that, you know, that's, that's what they should do is they look at what is happening in and around. When are people actually going to be having their eyes on a TV? Um, and yeah, why not make it about, you know, why didn't we have an Easter themed round? You know, we didn't. It was just like, oh, Easter's here. But everyone celebrates Easter in New Zealand and Australia. So there was missed opportunities in different areas when it comes to those kind of days off. I quite like the concept of, like, elongating a weekend, like Easter weekend, um, like to the point you're giving a team maybe a 10-day turnaround mm. from a Friday way to, to and then we've got a Tuesday night game, mm. which is a big game. So we actually have... Nothing else to watch on yeah, a Tuesday. But it still gives, yeah, exactly, but it still gives the team that uh, more than a buy, it gives them a 10-day turnaround where they can sort of have, have a bit of... But then we've got rugby for five, six days on the bounce, you know, mm. Thursday night to Tuesday or something. You know, try and just p pump more rugby out there and give people, when they've got a holiday period, rugby every every day that they've got a holiday. And it gives Tuesdays coaches. would interrupt your it, maths viewing, it, no mills at night. <laughs> I do not watch that. <laughs> but it gives you nice I'm forced to watch that. <laughs> okay. so, but it does give the coaches the breathing space, though, so, eh? What's that, sorry? It gives the coaches breathing yeah, space. Yeah, and I, I think that's what I was going to say. It, it gives the, the coaches an opportunity to go, well, I'm not going to rest them this week. You know, I'm not going to be able to... I'll, I'll, I'll put my best uh, team out there because guys are going to have a, a bit longer time to actually recover. So I think it, it, it has merit.
There you go. Well, some great Let's ideas. Come up with it. Well, you're right, sports fans as well, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you have. You've had a big weekend. You can go, Marty. Uh, no, there's a bigger weekend still to come because it is the Super Rugby Opiki Finals that has been decided. Uh, it will be the Chiefs Manawa up against the Blues Woman. And in a world first, uh, the final will be streamed vertically on TikTok this Saturday, all thanks to Two Degrees. This campaign is fighting for fear by giving women's rugby the national coverage and broadcast exposure it deserves. Jump onto Two Degrees TikTok for more and see the big final this coming Saturday on Sky Sport NZ TikTok. It is an absolutely brilliant initiative. I'm coming to you, Taylor, because you're the youngest of the crew here, so you're probably <laughs> the only one that uses TikTok. <laughs> but how cool is this? Oh, it's so good. And, and um, it's innovative as well. Well, down here in New Zealand it is. Yeah. Um, the basketball already yes. do it, but let's try it in rugby. And it's expanding us to new audiences, and that's what rugby needs to do. It needs new audiences because it's an ageing population who watch rugby. And, you know, kids are always on TikTok. Their kids Lives pop up like all the time, you know? I don't know. Your kids would I, both I not be know. on TikTok. How's it, how's it on TikTok? I thought they're only short videos. No, it's the, you can have like live streams on TikTok. I know, look at me explaining oh. TikTok to you. Um, but yeah, you can have live streams and it pops up on your phone. I mean, you know, you could be just scrolling and then it's like, oh, look, there's a live Super Rugby game. Anyone can just click and watch that all over the world, not just in New Zealand, which is cool. Yeah, initiatives, like you said, uh, and creating different, different things, trying things uh, around rugby, which is just brilliant. Not many people would probably have expected the Chiefs Manua to head down to Christchurch against Matatu and not pick up that victory. That determined where the final will be this weekend. It'll be in Auckland uh, for the Blues. Mills, huge home field advantage. These two teams have played twice this year. It's been split evenly. Yeah, massive. And, and given the fact that um, you know, the, the Chiefs Manoa have come off a, a loss, yeah. um, there's definitely issues in terms of their, um, their line-out. Um, but this was, you know, was the, uh, uh, the game against the Blues. Um, you know, they're they're going to be tough to beat at home. Both teams are absolutely stacked, but on the surface, Taylor, the Blues have been building throughout the season and have to be the team to beat. Oh, the competition itself has been interesting, right? Because the champions didn't pick up a win in the first three weeks. Um, the Blues have been building nicely, and it's a product of the last two years, right? Because they underperformed the previous two years, and they'll, they'll be the first ones to admit that as well. With the cattle that they had, they, they matched everyone for Black Fern, so now I think it's that time in the saddle together. They haven't had too many changes, and so now they're finally um, firing. I think the Manawa, though, will be disappointed with how yeah. they've gone, because everyone backed the Manawa. I think it's like a dollar one that they were going to win, right? And so um, it, it's been quite evenly matched now, so I'm really looking forward to the game. Uh, it, it is literally a flip of the coin for me. I don't know who's going to win it. Can I ask you, does does the rivalry that mm. like, obviously is filtered from the men's Super Rugby, mm. does, that, does that go into the women's game as well? Like, the Blues and the Chiefs are like... Yeah. I think... Or is it, is it that... Because there's not massive history there. Yeah. Do they just kind of, like... I think naturally there's a rivalry yeah. between, you know... That, that side of the yeah, Bombay yeah, yeah, than yeah. this side. Yeah. Um, but equally, I, I don't think it's as fierce as it is in the men's because when you look at the Black Ferns in general, I mean, that's half half in your, half your team you're playing against and they're all mm. kind of friends, friends off the field. So it's, it's not actually as rife as, as it is in the men's game where, you know, you want to you wanna hit that person hard like that because they are such good friends off it, which is a very different thing in the women's game, I would say, towards the men's. But it's not as big, but I think it's going to get big because, remember, this tournament's in its infancy, right? Um, um, like I think the Manawa and the Matatu, all of a sudden they've got a rivalry yeah. right now because that grand final last year, it was Manawa's for the taking. Matatu came and picked their pocket yeah. and now they, yeah, that's a rivalry. Who would have known <laughs> that it would be Matatu and Manawa? We'll hear your voice. You'll be commentating yes. uh, that Sky Sleeper Rugby Opeki final. I'm going to be watching on TikTok. You two get your kids uh, to teach <laughs> you how to use that app. Do not go anywhere. There's still plenty more to come on the breakdown. Yeah, we're really excited to be able to run this for this age group. Provides a, a real focus point in our pathway for guys to aspire to get to and get on a platform where they can, you know, test their skills. What we're after is a competition format to see guys playing and, and I suppose in game, you know, this is a platform for us to select our New Zealand under 20 group and the professional game later on. I think what this tournament provides is the opportunity for, for players across New Zealand to match up against their counterparts and other franchises and you know when those matchups get even, 
the players that really enjoy the pressure or rise to the occasion, they sort of step out and put their hand up. So from us, for a selection point of view, uh, massively important for the players themselves. Uh, it's a great shop window to showcase what they can do. The Hurricanes, that's brilliant! As a group of coaches, we're pretty aligned on what type of players we're looking for. So we want players that are constant during 80 minutes, play with a good spirit, a good intent. You know, the little intangible ones are players that look to put other people into better positions, players that like to work to create space for someone else to express themselves. So we don't necessarily need the best individual player. We really do look for uh, the best team player. This is a lot of these boys' first opportunity to be into a real high-performance environment. Yes, it's short, um, but it's also pretty intense. We want them to grow as a, as a person, we want them to grow as a player, we want them to get an understanding of what it's like to be a professional athlete and the grind that it is. But also what we want them to have is we want them to have a connection to the Blues. We understand they'll also, not all of them will stay, all of them will pick up contracts elsewhere, um, but right now we're trying to grow a connection with the, with the Blues and the individuals. Ricky Rubin drops it off, Alpha Kipu on a beautiful line, Kipu all the way, that's brilliant, what a try. Going towards the, the World Championships in Cape Town, my aspiration is that we are consistent for 80 minutes in each game, we're a very difficult team to beat, that we express our style of play and we impose our style of play on the opposition. You know, if we can do that consistently, be a team very difficult to beat, uh, with our natural sort of DNA and we play the way we play the game, you know, we will pose uh, problems for the opposition and, and hopefully we put ourselves in those playoff pitches to, to compete for the title. New opportunities for the up and coming players in New Zealand rugby. Not just New Zealand though, this is the new uh, the rugby championship under 20 competition uh, and it's an inaugural season. So New Zealand, South Africa, Australia and Argentina just like uh, the men play. It's exciting. This team is named on Tuesday and yep. it's there to match what the Six Nations under 20s are doing, Taylor. Yep. It's been a long time coming but we're here. Yeah, we, well we need the pathways, right? Like, I think we've done ourselves a disservice by not creating those pathways after COVID. Um, the Six Nations teams, they're thriving because they have game time and you know previously we've just played against Australia, Fiji, you know, and those in the islands and you're not really testing yourselves and then so you go up to the under 20s and you're playing up against the guys who've been going constantly. Yeah. Um, obviously they got rid of the under 19s, I do think there still needs to be a pathway there um, but it's a step in the right direction. I feel like I'm being ageist here uh, bringing this up all the time, it has been a long time but <laughs> for you guys there were secondary schools, there were under 19s, there were under 21s, there were Colts as well Marshy, yeah. yeah. what were your experiences like? Yeah. They were brilliant and, yeah. and the under 19s and both the Colts for me I felt mm. at that stage probably that that was probably highly likely to be the pinnacle of my rugby career and, and to wear what was as close as I could possibly get to an all-black jersey. It was an incredible feeling and you know you, you're, you're making your way through the, the club yeah. system or um, through the secondary school system or whatever it will be and you finally get to represent your country at, in that, at that level you never know what the future's going to hold. So I, I found it an incredible privilege um, and I, I, I will always remember it in those moments and the players that I played with and incredibly, I could, I could name them, but I won't because we've only got a certain amount of time. <laughs> the players that were in my side for the, for the Colts yeah. that went on to be All Blacks, there was at least eight of them in that side that went on to be All Blacks. You're Pretty absolutely cool. right. It's the pathway mm. and we need to make sure that we keep encouraging that pathway and making sure that those, those, those young kids have the ability to put on a jersey at that level. Few of yours become All Blacks as well, Mills? Yeah, I mean, a lot. And, and great players come through that, that pathway. I think the good thing about now that they've got this championship, it's a good lead up into the, mm. to the rugby, to the World mm. Cup, right? Because often they've sort of struggled to find uh, oppositions. They go and play the, the Barbarians or a club mm. team. This year will set them up in terms of the structure going forward and, and hopefully they, uh, they succeed. Well, someone without a doubt who would have played age grade rugby in New Zealand and would have been an absolute giant is Sam Whitelock. And despite the rumours of the last month about him potentially coming out of international retirement, that is it. He has he's done 153 test matches. He finishes uh, as the highest test capped player ever for the All Blacks. Once his French season is done with Poe, that is it. He's hanging up the boots for good. Uh, he's coming back to New Zealand, and from my understanding, standing. Uh, he'll be on a farm somewhere, Marshy. <laughs> yeah, I heard that as well. Which, to be fair, like I'll believe it when I see it, because 
he used to tease Richie McCaw in my times with the Crusaders and then the All Blacks for a couple of years and said, you always said you're going to go back to the farm in Kurao. Yeah. I don't think he's put a pair of gumboots on, <laughs> sat in a <laughs> tractor a ever since. He's turned into something completely different to a farmer, so the challenge is on Sam Whitelock. So what do you think his next move will be? Would he make a good coach? I mean, obviously this conversation um, has potentially happened with Razor about bringing him back in and, and mentoring others. Maybe that's why these rumours started. Would he make a good line-out coach or something else? I definitely think he would. I mean, he's been in the, the environment. He's led the way in terms of the, the, the line-out stuff. Does he want to be a coach? Possibly not. He's probably want to go back and sort of reflect. I like the fact he's come out after all those rumours about him sort of coming back to play for the All Blacks. He's just hit, it, hit the nail on the head and just come back and said, well, I'm retiring. And I'm, um, you know, when you, when you finish up, you often do that. You go back, eh, Marshy, and you sort of reflect on what yeah. you want to do um, and, and take plenty of time in terms of the next next stages of his career. You're bang on. Like, I think, you, you, first, when you finish from the game, the, the real energy is about jumping straight back into it. Mm. But you don't really know where your niche is, whether it's coaching, whether, mm. it, whether it's TV, whether it's not rugby at all, whether it's club level, whether it's kids. You need to step back and just breathe a little bit. And I think that's what Sam Whitelock needs when you've been through the arduous years he's been through. I don't think he wants to jump straight into something because he might not enjoy it. You know who was a classic example of that it was Martin Johnson? Yeah. I think he got thrown into coaching too quick and then straight into England. Mm. And he was always going to be a better coach, but he got thrust into it too early. Mm. He seems like a man who's content with his decision, right? And you talk about, you know, going into coaching. You need to be really passionate to go into coaching about it because, yes, you, people can ask him a few questions. He might be good to come in, you know, every now and then as an advisor, but I don't know if he would want to coach, you know, when you chat to him. Um, but it'll be interesting to see where he does end up. Yeah. In terms of the legacy that he will leave with the New Zealand Rugby Mills, these are your moments this week, some of the biggest moments in All Blacks history this guy's been a part of. Remiss, remiss of us not to sort of mention that in Mills' moments for this week, so... <laughs> Uh, well, I thought we'd re rewind the, uh, the the clock back a little bit and um, and focus on the Sam Whitelock era. And so the first one, really, for me, I mean, you, you mentioned it before, seven tries um, throughout his career. But two of them came on his debut, which is this one here against the uh, the Irish and uh, in New Plymouth, um, the Rugby World Cup, won that line out in the semi final to propel us through to the to the final. Uh, and of course, you know, we've seen him many times in this Crusaders outfit. He's sort of won big games, won big finals. Uh, has Sam, and what a moment that was. Gee, did he start in there his own in goal or what? <laughs> um, and of course, who would forget that last the quarter final came off the bench, and what better man to win that and win us that quarter final against the Irish? Is that his greatest moment, do you think, Marshy? Hard to define, isn't it? Like, that was a magic moment, but you can rely on Sam Whitelock, can't you, throughout his career to come up with those big moments. And that, that's what makes great players. Yeah. You know, players have longevity. They have a lot of time in the jersey and a lot of time in the game. But the real special ones that you put in that top echelon of player, they come up with those really special moments reasonably frequent, frequently throughout their career. And, like, you, you just capped on at Mills, like, whether it was for the Crusaders or the All Blacks, he could pull something out of the bag when needed. That's what a teammate is. It's quite remarkable when you think about the legacy, right? Seven titles with the Crusaders. He's obviously never uh, lost a Bledis Low or <laughs> yeah. uh, a rugby championship. Four Rugby World Cups, two yeah. of those uh, were championship titles. Yeah. For his career, I also want to touch on the position. Yeah. Being yeah. a lock is... I think the most unsung position there is. I mean, you don't get the glitzy tries like the backs, the front rowers. When you get a scrum penalty, they get the tap on the back. It's not the guys in the engine room <laughs> that are also pushing them. They're not hunting like the Lucys <laughs> and, you know, getting those, you know. It's you're in the doing the hard yakka. You're cleaning the next rack. You know, yes, you jump and get the line out and get the cool photos. But at the end of the day, you are doing the hard work that goes unseen. And, and that's he's, he signifies that kind of person, you know. When you actually watch him on the field, he's not, you know, doing those really elaborate runs like the other guys but he's there and he's you know cleaning out hard he's winning the ball back and that's that was really big and it's a hard position to play 153 tests mm. and that's why he's only got seven tries because he's the one helping everyone else score those tries and I think to play that many tests and to have that much you know a big career like that as a lock is pretty pretty difficult but two most capped international players of all time both locks yeah, exactly yeah. I mean, which Alan is crazy is, when, is, when you're talking nuts. about what they yeah. do in that position yeah. so let's give the locks some love yeah. then, Taylor. let's, let's please let's <laughs> give the locks some love so we've asked these guys to pick their top five greatest locks 
of all time. Uh, and there are some names missing. There are some names added that you may be questioning at home. Uh, we'll start off with the ones that you've all gone for. So you've all gone for Sam Whitelock. That was an obvious for you. And the other, uh, Taylor, was Victor Matfield. Why did you choose Victor? I want to start this chat off by saying I was actually born the year that uh, rugby went professional. So I've only picked people that I've actually watched. And when I grew up, Victor Matfield, I saw him on every single test match. You know, um, when the Springboks played the All Blacks, he was always very prominent. Um, everyone just knew that was the lock. He was good. You know, yes, he had Bucky's Booker with him, but he was fantastic. And he's a great person off the field as well. He just had such a towering, dominant figure. And he could get around the park. I mean, you guys played against him. Mm. Yeah, he was brilliant, and, and he, I don't think you can underestimate how very good he was at modernising the line-out, like getting it to the point where it wasn't just about manipulation, it was about timing and accuracy, the, the, the ability that he had with his hookers, Bismarck Duplessis and mm. etc. like to, to win line-out ball just off pure speed and timing, he innovated that. Um, you know, and I think he was a catalyst for the way the line-out changed dramatically into the future. And singled out too. Like I, I mean, I remember constantly, um, you know, trying to sort of compete against the, the alignments. Well, not me physically, but our, you know, the tactics into it. Mm -hmm. But when you're targeting one guy in your analysis and trying to yep. trying to um, take that sort of strength away from him, that says he's a great player, and that's that's one of the things the All Blacks had to do. Mills, you've picked uh, John Eels also. Uh, you've put Brody Retallick in there, and Brad Thorn. Yeah, I love Thorny. <laughs> I think. Um, Did you have to pick him? Oh, I thought. I, I, when I think about it, I think. What he'd done is he sort of evolved. You know, you, he, you're used to, before him, see your locks typically that you sort of send up and you, um, they line out winners. He was a little bit different. Um, you know, wasn't as tall, probably didn't get lifted too, uh, too many times, but the physicality that he showed, particularly with ball in hand and defence in his league days, um, no, I just love Thorn, uh, Thorny because of, because of that. I, I think, you know, um, you know, he evolved in, the, in that sort of space and guys behind him, like the Retallics, sort of came in, came in behind him and followed him. There's a couple of uh, modern day locks that are still playing in the mix as well. Uh, Brody Retallic for you. Oh, he brings the niggle. <laughs> Everyone knows when you're playing against Brody Retallick, you get to watch, you know, what's happening in that ruck because he also brought, yes, he brought the physical presence, but he also brought that little bit of attitude that made you always you know, second guess when you were going to run at him or into the ruck where he was there. And, you know, he played side by side by Sam Whitelock. They're the most capped duo together. And, you know, iron sharpens iron. Those two together were fierce. And, he, yeah, he brings that niggle and I love it. I love to see it. So why do you think Marshy's left Brody Retallick out of his uh, top five greatest of all time? <laughs> well, let's, let's, I let's let him Kiwi, explain that. Yeah, every Kiwi would have put Brody Retallick in there. Why have you gone elsewhere? Well, look, I, I tried to be balanced. Now, look, and first of all, before we show any clips, I want to thank the people of Hamilton for allowing <laughs> me into Hamilton and out of Chiefs territory alive. <laughs> because uh, they didn't see this. They hadn't seen. Well, they hadn't seen it. If they'd seen it on social media, I thought. But there was <laughs> there was a, an element of respect that it was probably because you actually didn't weren't aware. But anyway, <laughs> so I had to. Like, I was like, right, I, I've got. To, I know I've got to back this up. So like, I was like, so like, stats, stats, you know. So. I had to choose between Itzabeth and Retallick, and I had to do it in a way that I wasn't biased towards an All Black. Mm -hmm. I had to be balanced. So Itzabeth, they've both played 11 years for their countries, yeah? Um, Itzabeth has had two Rugby World Cup wins. Yeah. Brodie's had one. Eban Itzabeth has had 119 tests at a winning ratio of 74%. Retallick, 109 tests at a winning ratio of 82. So Brodie's had a little bit more success, but Itzabeth has played more tests. There's nothing in it. So you based like, it on I, one look, extra I, World I Cup love win. Brody Retallick. And I was just trying not to pretty much put two New Zealanders in there because I wanted to sort of say that there are great locks around the world. Alan Wynne Jones, yes. amazing what he's achieved. Yeah. Locks have got longevity. Um, Maro Itaji is probably the, the one that's a little bit of a funny gooseberry in my mix, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't leave the English out because. Yeah, it's just balance, isn't it? You also know how much uh, everyone in South Africa loves the breakdown, didn't you, Marshy? Yes. You know how many people <laughs> on Super Sport. Um, just one other name that no, none of you mentioned uh, on your list, and people at home of the older generation are probably thinking, where are they? Sir Colin Meads. 
Oh. Is that just because, uh, the, obviously, the, the age and the generation thing? That the you... directive was I was just going to say that. Oh, is that what yeah. it was? Yeah. OK. Because Otherwise... me being a proud King Country to... girl, I wouldn't be allowed back into Tick <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't pick Pine Tree. So let me just be clear to everyone. We were told it had to be from the professional era, okay. and Pine Tree wasn't there. Well, yeah. I'm glad you've justified that, because there'll be a whole heap of people, including my father and law going, this is ludicrous. <laughs> yeah. This is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, do not go anymore. We're still plenty more to come on the Breakdown. We talk Hong Kong Sevens next and our All Black Game Changers. Throws it up to Dane Coles and the hooker is under the post. Dane Coles exploded onto the ball. Jim Zandrup, he's trying a drop kick from the million mile. There he is again offloading, finding Nonu! Oh, that was brilliant from Sonny Bill Williams. Piece of his. This could be another extraordinary try. Christian Cullen, the hero of the hour. And Dan Carter, Carter kick and chase, and Carter scores! What a beauty! Wow! The best thing I can say about Aaron, so... I think two years ago, Kevin Norkey was putting together a list of current players. Um, top 50 in the world. I put Aaron Smith down as number one, as the most effective, game-changing, best player in the world at that time. And so Norks came back to me and said, well, everyone else is putting Antoine Dupont down as number one. I said, yeah, no, he's a good player, but how many competitions has he won? He's won a few with Toulouse, but how many, how many major ones has he won with France? Aaron um, Smith has won all of them. Yes, the All Blacks Game Changers is coming to Sky TV very, very soon. We've talked about the greatest players of all time, but the Game Changers are players that revolutionised their positions, and I guess that's what Wayne Smith is talking about when he's saying Aaron Smith. Do you agree? Is Aaron Smith the, the Game Changer at halfback, or is it Dupont? I think Aaron Smith changed the game and changed the theory of the way the halfback should modernise the game. Absolutely, yeah, I think he's right. Um, there was a period, I guess, that I was involved with where um, the game was quite slow uh, around the breakdown, where the five-second rule wasn't in play and you had to be a lot more creative. Um, you could do that with your own physicality or use steps to try and bring forwards into it to create and regenerate momentum and re regenerate fast ball when it was static. The five-second rule was perfect for Aaron Smith and the type of player that he was to come in and the speed of clearance, the ability to have vision, have pace. Um, yeah, the game needed somebody like him to say this is how we're going to speed the game up and this is the best way to do it and I don't think anybody in the modern day has replicated what he brought to that jersey. It's changed the game. Has changed he the has game. He's changed so, the game. Smithy knows his stuff, doesn't he? <laughs> hey, we'll you give can, him some you can't argue with the professor, can you? <laughs> no. uh, we've already heard from you in your game changer mills. Taylor, who is yours? Um, it's funny you're talking about uh, the professor because he's probably another reason why I picked this one. So some of the story, stories he told me about him. So I've picked um, for a long with Tana Umanga um, for a multitude of reasons. Um, one being obviously the first Pacific Island player to captain the All Blacks, um, first captain to lead Kapa O Pango. Um, I mean, he was synonymous with rugby when I was growing up. You know, everyone who had dreads, you're like, you're just copying Tana Umanga. <laughs> um, but the way he played as well, you know, yes, he was also wing, then went into centre, did that transition seamlessly. You know, everyone talks about Rico Ioane, well, he did it first, you know, it wasn't, he's not, um, you know, the first person to do that. Um, but when I was talking to Wayne Smith in Christchurch a couple of weeks ago, he was telling me the story how, um, you know, him and Ted, Sir Graham Henry, you know, would have these big team talks um, and Tana just said to him, actually, just stop doing the team talks because no one's listening. Um, and they listened <laughs> and they just stopped doing them and you know that's leadership right there and and he he formed this leadership team around him um and i think it actually changed the way captaincy worked in the all blacks it wasn't just you've got this one sole captain you've now got a leadership group and he's so passionate about the game obviously he's been involved you know player coach now coaching more under pacifica more of an, a passion project for him but um you guys have played with him uh, as a player he was outstanding but i think off the field he was just as great too yeah and to your point you're right about the leadership style i was part of that group and uh, um, when we gave him feedback, he did actually go and, and, and give that. I think thought, Brad Thorne might have fallen asleep in one of those sort of meetings <laughs> before they came. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. But yeah. he did. I mean, and often like, they started on the wing, and now it's become 
pretty common. You know, yeah. I mean, you've been seen in the women's game with Steinmetz, yeah, you know, yeah, um, yeah. coming into playing in the midfield. But they almost have to sort of uh, appreciate playing on the wing to then move themselves into a, a physical position and also the ability, and, and that's what he had, mm. to be able to distribute as well and, and put guys into space, which is fantastic. I'm actually smiling because uh, just slightly off topic a little bit for, for 20 seconds. <laughs> we had a re relaxation therapist that came in for the All Blacks in 99. Yeah. And the key role was to try and calm people down after training runs and that to keep them, you know, sort of... <laughs> energy levels and to try and relax them in that and they'd put us into a room in a dark room to sort of then they'd start sort of it's like a meditation thing and he'd start saying your hands are getting <laughs> heavy <laughs> like that to try and sort of <laughs> and, and literally 20 seconds the whole front row and probably the locks were all down. asleep oh. they're snoring oh. <laughs> it's just oh, like then. There's, there's no, there's no, they're just asleep <laughs> so yeah anyway look uh, one of those that was not like that um, for me who's my game changer mm. And there's a reason for this was Sean Fitzpatrick. Now, look, when we talk about people that revolutionised the game, for me, he came in, yes, he was a captain, like Tana, but it wasn't his captaincy. Like, he was a great captain, and his record is impeccable. It's the, st it's the style that he brought to that jersey. Like, he was tough, he was uncompromising, but what he did, Fitzy, was he changed the way that hookers approached the game. Like, they were always expected to go to the breakdown, to go to rucks. Now, Fitzy, the amount of tries or the amount of times that he was and a sister to a try in the outside channel was because he didn't honeypot towards the ball. He didn't gravitate to where hookers were supposed to be. He saw the game for what it was. He saw the width of the field and went, you know what? That ruck is 20 metres away. Why the hell would I go there? Yeah. And he stood and held his ground and all of a sudden hookers become better balanced. I think the next one that kind of got his head around it was Phil Kearns after him and they had some ding-dongs. But for me, the reason I've chosen him is because he ch showed that front rowers can play with the ball, they can be distributors, they can score tries on the wing, and that changed the mindset of the way that you play the game in the front row. He made it exciting to yeah, be a front yeah, roller. Yeah, it did. So yeah. clever. I mean, and, and in that era, I mean, if you didn't go to rucks, you'd consider not working hard enough. I mean, but mm. to be able to have the patience and understand, well, what's the use of me getting there? Because by the time I get there, I'm, I'm no use. Yeah. I might as well stay out and, and be out in the, in the open. And look where, it, where, where the game's got to. Look at some of our hookers that, that are out wide now. These How days. do you think he would have gone in sevens? There you go. No, no, no. No, nah, no, good. Have enjoyed that. No, no. <laughs> for all of that uh, out in the outside channels, he wouldn't have had the work rate for sevens. Well, like the way. reason why I mention it right now is because the most <laughs> iconic sevens series, Hong Kong, is on right now. Both New Zealand men and women have made the final later on tonight, and you can watch that all live on Sky. The men are taking on France, and the women are taking on USA. You guys have been there. What's it like? The South Stand at Hong Kong is one of the greatest things, not just in rugby, but in sport, right? Hey, sacrosanct. <laughs> the South Stand at Hong Kong, what's on the South Stand stays in the South Stand. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. these guys don't even remember, yeah. that's why. We were looking at each other going, were we there? <laughs> Some, <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> somehow we were there. No, amazing tournament. Uh, incredible environment. Like, I think when you get mystique, historic tournaments, they have a feel about them before anyone ever turns up and then once the crowd turns up there's this expectation level and I loved going there, played prior to that in the tens and then went along and witnessed the sevens in all its glory and uh, Hong Kong, simply the best, it's awesome. Well that's where all the, the dress up came from, right? That South Stand yeah. because it was just a, a party atmosphere and the whole lead up, so I, I was fortunate enough to, to play there uh, for, the, for New Zealand sevens and uh, we won against the Fiji, it's an iconic tournament. Yeah. Um, and, and, but it is tough and um, you know they, these two teams, how good is it that uh, both the men's and the women's are amazing. in the finals, so it's going to be amazing. Yeah, with just a couple of sevens tournaments remaining as well, it's very exciting, so make sure you do support our men's and women's sevens program a little bit later on tonight on Sky. Uh, well, there's a massive derby match. You know when we were talking about scheduling and you said, let's have a big derby on a bye weekend, there is one coming up. <laughs> uh, the Chiefs taking on the Hurricanes from Wellington this weekend. Taylor, it is mouthwatering. When you look at the different matchups, what excites you? Is it the tens? Is it Brent Cameron against Damian McKenzie? Is it Geordie against Anton Leonard Brown? Do you look at the number eights in these ball players? Where do you go? It's so hard, right? Because the Hurricanes are the informed team now, and so yeah. the Chiefs really are an underdog heading into any game. But I do think everyone thinks the Hurricanes are there. But I'm really interested to see how they go without Cam Roygaard in this Derby game because he really has been the maestro in some of those Derby games. He's been fantastic. Um, the outside back, so for me, for the Chiefs, I mean, they are 
incredible. You know, Ottawa. oh, just the way that that whole backline can manipulate space. I think it is going to be so hard for the Hurricane team to defend. Um, they got to win the battle up front, I reckon, the Hurricanes to stop the Chiefs backs getting that ball because I think it might be good night nurse once they do. Yeah, big point. No Camroy guard. Crusaders, I mean, sorry, not the Crusaders, the Hurricanes haven't lost a game this season. So yeah. how do they go without him? Well, look, obviously you've got TJ, so mm. I feel that you've got adequate cover. In fact, you've got something completely different that offers you attacking um, prowess in different areas, experience, competitiveness. So I think they'll function really, really well. Like the, the 20 other players in the team, I think will be fine. You mentioned it, back three. Mm. And when I say the 20 other, I'm talking about the two sets of 10. <laughs> it's the two tight fives yeah. Yeah. that will determine this game for me. Like that's where the, the battle will be won within the game. Like, Whoever fronts up in, the, the, in, those, um, in those key areas, line out, scrum, field position, that'll be massive in this game because the rest of it across the park is matchups to die for. Big time. Plenty yeah. of matchups. But the, to back up that, what you've said, I think the two tens, uh, Cameron and also McKenzie, sort yeah. of, this is a time now for Cameron's been good, he's been solid. I, I would love to see sort of what he's going to sort of produce given, you know, this is a huge game for him. OK, well, you know what I'm going to ask you then next? What is your prediction? Who wins <laughs> that one? <laughs> I'm going Chiefs. I'm going Chiefs. Yeah, I'm going Chiefs. I'd love to see the Chiefs get up, but man, I I um, I think the Hurricanes. I think I think home home advantage as well. Is, um, I think they might might. You're might not welcome back in Hamilton. Neither are you after what you've said tonight about Brady oh, Retallick. Oh, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. And I'm going to hurt myself more, but I have to agree. I think if it was it in Hamilton, the Chiefs, but I think the Hurricanes at home. Yeah. Mm, they, they'll sneak it. Not by many. Big, big game to come. Super Rugby OPEC finals, which will be live on TikTok uh, as well. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks to you two, and we'll see you next week. Off the base of the scrum. One pass, Henry Patterson try. Bit of rope and dope from Fiji. All that pressure they were under. Oh, how about that? And we'll just explode our way through it. Such a powerful runner, Christy Kershey. The pickup is quite superb from Michaela Blythe. She counters on the French mistake. Nashu dummies and scores and wins it for the All Black Sevens.